Do you want to start growing native plants in your yard, but don't know where to find them? Or maybe you aren't even sure what a native plant is for your area. Or maybe you are in a situation where you can't plant anything right now, but you still want to learn about native plants and enjoy them in the wild. Well, your state's Native Plant Society is a great resource that can help you in all of these situations. Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, you can do so for less than the cost of a cup of coffee or a meal at your favorite fast food place. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. Today we have multiple guests representing native plant societies in different parts of the eastern U.S. They are Randy Eckel from the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, Jeff Nelson from the Kentucky Native Plant Society, and Ellen Honeycutt from the Georgia Native Plant Society. Hi, Randy, Jeff, and Ellen. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi, thanks for having us. So excited to be here. Thank you very much. Oh, you are welcome. And I am really looking forward to this conversation because Native Plant Societies can be such valuable resources. And I don't know that a lot of people or that everyone at least recognizes that they even exist or what Native Plant Societies do. But before we get started, can each of you tell us just a little bit about how you got interested in native plants? Ellen, do you want to start us out? Sure. Yeah, I've probably been interested in native plants for about 23 years now. And I was never really much of a gardener. And I was a young parent with young kids uh, and just kind of starting to come out of the fog of being a new parent and deciding that I would work on my yard. And a neighbor down the street said, hey, you can get free plants if you join the Georgia Native Plant Society because they go on plant rescues. So that was really my first introduction to this whole concept. And I did join and I did go on rescues. And before long, I liked native plants better than any non-native plants and decided that that's all I wanted to work with. Very interesting. And just in case some of our listeners don't know, what is a plant rescue? A plant rescue is when we get permission from either a property owner or a developer to rescue plants that are going to be destroyed as a result of construction or a project. Um, for example, we've had uh, reservoir projects, we've had sewer line replacements, we've had new subdivisions. It's really a, a lot of different things. And so we get permission and we go on guided rescues. So these aren't just a, oh, I see a pretty plant growing by the side of the road. Let me dig it up. These are plants that would be destroyed and completely lost yes. due to other activities that are going on in that area if they weren't removed. That's right. And, and we have the permission and we have trained people to help people rescue them proper way to help with their success so that they don't just dig things up and then take them home when they die. Which is always helpful and important. Okay, Jeff, do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got interested in native plants? Okay, well, I've been, I'd say, an amateur naturalist since I was a kid. Always interested in bugs, animals, plants, and that. Uh, but over the years, as I came more to understand uh, the concept of ecosystems and the fact that plants are at the base of everything, if, if it wasn't for the plants, uh, none of us would be here. I began paying more attention to plants and recognizing and learning about the differences between native plants and non-native plants and so forth. And eventually just uh, uh, became enamored of the native plants around me. 
uh, starting in my home home state of California, where I was born and, and grew up. But then when we moved here to uh, Kentucky in 1987, uh, completely new ecosystem from what I was used to in California, and just became fascinated with the plants that, that lived in the eastern forests. Uh, so became a member of the Kentucky Native Plant Society in around 1990. And Ended up becoming president last year, and that's where we are today. Yes, and like you said, very, very different from California here. Oh, yes. <laughs> Randy, you want to tell us a little bit about how you got interested in native plants? Sure. You know, it sounds like, you know, a little bit like Jeff. You know, I, I was a bit of a nerdy kid. I was a naturalist as a, as a kid, wound up spending a lot of time outdoors taking a look at uh, plants and insects and playing in the creek and whatnot. And then uh, as I went on to college and graduate school, I was actually doing research and um, on an agricultural system, actually, and realized no one was actually paying attention to any, any of the native plants that were off the field and how they might affect the research project. And then after I had concluded that research and started getting really interested in these native plants because I couldn't find them. These were plants I'd grown up with. And why couldn't I find these for sale? And um, discovered that they weren't, they weren't really being offered very much. And a lot of folks were disregarding them um, and disregarding their, their ecological services, really. Uh, they were simply buying you know, the common plants that were available in, in the local garden store. So I, I, I became really fascinated by the uh, mostly the plant and insect interactions really, but really uh, the place of native plants in the environment and became eager to, to have other people be aware of what place native plants have in the environment. And if anybody wants to hear more about kind of Randy's story, there's an episode that we just did that Randy and I just totally went off script and had some great conversations. <laughs> um, and it was a lot of fun, but... You can hear more about Randy's story and details about growing native plants and stuff there as well. I think it'd be a good companion to this, this episode, but it is always interesting to hear the different stories of how people really got interested in the native plants. But I have an important question that I think we need to address very early in our conversation, and I'm going to give each of you a chance to answer it. What's a native plant? Mm -hmm. So let's see. Ellen, let's start with you. I like the uh, the traditional definition, which is it's a plant, uh, at least in the United States, that was here before European settlers came. So I do use the uh, 1492, although I know that um, if some settlers came here before that. But, but generally, it's one that evolved here on its own wasn't brought over either on purpose or by accident uh, in packing material and things like that. So th that's my definition before European settlement. Jeff, you want to take it next? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, that's certainly uh, a good definition. Uh, I do like to broaden it a little bit more and I've even written it down. It's, it's basically those plants Native plants are those plants that originated in a given geographical area without any human involvement of, or that arrived there without intentional or unintentional um, uh, human activity. So basically they're the plants that evolved in a, in a, or came in through wind or some other method to an area without any human involvement. So. Randy? I don't have a lot to add to those, but I, I, I would agree to that. I know sometimes uh, uh, native plant enthusiasts can get into slightly pedantic discussions as to whether or not something's native in one county or the next county. And you know the, the question of whether or not that seed came from one county to the next county on the sole of someone's shoe or by a bird flying over top does begin to beg the question. But yes, certainly when we're talking about uh, plants that are native to ecosystems and to regions. Um, um, I'm a big um, proponent of folks learning about their ecoregions uh, because um, plants 
and insects and other creatures don't, they don't really pay any attention to political boundaries. They don't care about political boundaries. They are, they are on their own trajectory. And with global warming coming along, we're going to see some shifting in some of those lines of the eco regions and where um, both plants and animals are adapted to. Yes. And you just touched on why I asked that question too, is because there are so many different, different ways that people define native plants and the concepts are all the same, but the details can be very, very different. Are we talking about native to the entire nation? Are we in talking native to a region, to a state, to a part of a state, to a county? What are we talking about when we say native plants? Yeah. And that is a very important thing to think about because if we're talking about native plants and I'm defining it one way and somebody else is defining it another way, we may be talking about very different plants because like where Jeff and I are at in Kentucky, we go from the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi River. Where Ellen is at in Georgia, I mean, you guys go from the Appalachian Mountains down to the coast. Um, Randy, I don't know as much about New Jersey, but I know you've got coastal areas and non-coastal areas. So same sort of thing. Plants are native to very different areas. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes an important point in that you cannot discuss nativity without specifically addressing a geographical area. Uh, if, you, if you don't talk about the geography of a specific of a species, you're already confusing the issue as to nativity. Uh, the, the example I like to, to use is uh, when it comes to goldenrod, okay? Uh, the most common goldenrod, tall goldenrod, is native to the geographical region of the entire Eastern United States and a big part of the Western United States. It's, it's originated in that area and grows in that area. But then you have another goldenrod, which my t-shirt is right here, uh, Schwartz goldenrod, same, same genus, but it is found in only three counties in Kentucky and one county in Indiana. So uh, nativity has to refer to geography to be, be precise. I think your point's well taken, Jeff, and not only um, geography, but also species, being species specific. A lot of folks uh, have trouble getting into that deep dive. Uh, I remember years ago talking to a beekeeper who was looking for uh, plants for his honeybees in the fall. And I said, well, you, you, need, you need golden rods and asters to fill in that period of time. And he said, I, ha I, I have an aster. I have, I, I bought one aster and I said, well, no, there's, there's so many different asters and so many different golden rods. Uh, to the point of New Jersey, we actually do have um, a remarkable amount of uh, both biological and geographical diversity because if you, we're long and skinny and we're along the coast, but we do have the highlands, um, which are incredibly different, shall we say, than the coastal plain and certainly the little tongue of Cape May that sticks out there down on the southern tip. We have the Pine Barrens, we have the Delaware Bay Shore region, we have a Piedmont region. So we actually have a greater amount of geological and biological diversity than Pennsylvania does, despite the fact that Pennsylvania is a whole lot bigger than us and just next door. Um, because we do have all these different geographical regions and different plants that are adapted to the different regions. And so that kind of brings us to native plant societies. And well, I'll let you guys tell us, what is a native plant society? I mean, it, from the name, you'd guess it has something to do with native plants, but <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. All right. Um, for us, the Native Plant Society is a collection of people. Up until now, for the, we've been here since 1994, uh, all volunteers, and we are here to help pull together information to disseminate information, to inspire and educate our members, and also inspire them to use the plants themselves, uh, not just 
admire them where they are, but to think about incorporating them in their gardens and to conserve habitat and to support uh, initiatives and people and government entities that also support habitat conservation. So, so we're here to pull together information and to provide those resources to people to find and to learn from so that almost like uh, Amway, remember that? How you teach somebody and then they teach two more people and then those people teach two more people each and it just spreads. So, so we kind of see ourselves as helping to spread the information and to grow people that really are interested in native plants and conservation. That sounds terrific, Ellen. Um, I was not aware that uh, the Georgia Native Plant Society had been around that long. Uh, I was aware of them a couple of years ago because I know you folks have a, a plant of the year program um, that uh, I was aware of. The New Jersey Native Plant Society was actually formed in 83, 1983 by a few uh, forward thinking folks that were concerned about um, they were worried about really the conservation and um, education of folks relative to uh, the vast number of native plants in New Jersey. Um, so, you know, the, the mission of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey is the appreciation, protection, and well, to promote the appreciation, protection, and study of New Jersey's native flora. So we we educate folks about how to use them. We educate folks about the importance of them. We educate folks about conservation of these plants. And we have a great time while we're at it. I mean, we have 11 chapters throughout the state, each of which has a great deal of autonomy and different chapters focus on, on different interests. You know, some of them mostly like to go on outdoor hikes um, and lead folks, uh, educate folks in that way. Some folks do tabling events at festivals and try to encourage folks to, to use native plants in their gardens and explain why the rare and very special plants, those are not plants that you want to necessarily put in your garden. Those are ones that are, that are really worthy of conservation in the wild. So um, the number of native plants across the United States, I think is really quite extraordinary at this point. Uh, maybe we should have another podcast where we have just like a conclave of all of us together. That would be, that would be fascinating. Yeah. That would be fascinating, but I'm afraid we'd get too many voices and never be able to keep up much less. Oh my gosh, that would be a long one because I know <laughs> we all like to talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, not much to add to uh, uh, what Randy and Ellen, Ellen said. Uh, the Kentucky Native Plant Society was formed in 1986, uh, so uh, been around a while. And I think just the purpose as expressed in our bylaws pretty much sums it up. It's uh, to promote conservation of native plants and natural plant communities in Kentucky, to promote public education in botanical science and to encourage botanical research in Kentucky. So uh, basically the, the goal is to preserve natural plant communities through education and conservation activities. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And all volunteer, as, as was <laughs> mentioned mentioned earlier. Uh, none of us get paid for this. And PSNJ as well. We are all volunteer. <laughs> yes, that's pretty common for all Native Plant Societies, I think, is that it's really a volunteer and done from love of the Native plants and getting the word out there. But yeah, most Native Plant Societies that I'm aware of, and definitely all three of us, their focus is education. It's conservation, preservation, and research. It's some combination of all of those for the native plants to that state, understanding that, yeah, plants don't recognize our geopolitical boundaries, but still they're in the state and they're native to the state. So they're still native plants to that state. So yeah, very important work that these native plant societies are doing. And with it, I think it's also important to recognize that Native Plant Societies aren't designed for expert botanists who are at the top of their field and have multiple PhDs or anything like that. They're really, I would say, for everyday normal people who are just interested and want to dip their toes in and start learning. 
all the way up to people who are self-trained and are really good experts and also for those professional scientists and researchers and botanists. Would you all say the same thing? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the Kentucky Native Plant Society, it was originally formed by professional academics and botanists and that, but you're absolutely right. Uh, if, you know, we, if you leave the society, uh, just a bunch of, bunch of uh, experts and professional botanists, uh, you know, nothing much will happen in terms of preservation and conservation and edging and such. So it's, it's important that everybody gets involved. And I'm a perfect example. I mean, I, I have no botanical education and training other than what I've learned on my own and, and learned by being a member of the Kentucky Native Plant Society. Um, I have no botanical background prior to this at all. So. I know the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, we certainly have a very wide range of folks that are involved in the society and they're very passionate about native plants. And it it ranges. We were originally, um, you know, I believe all or most of our founding members were, um, we had some restoration ecologists involved. Um, the university professor was teaching botany at the time, I believe. And to this day, we have an extremely wide range of membership that ranges from uh, professional restoration ecologists and professors and folks that are involved in native plants for a living all the way down to uh, beginning gardeners and gardeners that are trying to understand what a native plant is and why they might want to have a native plant in their garden. You know, it's, it's a simple question, but one that we certainly come up against again and again when someone has, has learned a little bit about native plants and their importance in um, the environment and how they can make a difference in their garden. And then their next question is, well, what's a native? Mm -hmm. what, what's native to my area? Because they, they don't know, you know, and some of the invasive species that we, um, we all deal with, um, sometimes it, it comes as quite a shock to folks to, when they find out that those are not native. They just assume since they're everywhere, oh, they must be natives. Like, no, no, they're invasive. That's why that particular mm -hmm. one's there. Yeah, absolutely. Georgia was founded by uh, amateurs, shall we say, people that were just interested. And um, I, I would say we have a mix of, of professionals and new people. And we like to uh, try and help learn from each other. But we are mostly not botanists. I would say that I would agree with that. But we welcome all experience levels and, and hope that each of us can learn from each other. Yes. And that's why I brought this up because I don't want people thinking, oh, the Native Plant Society and thinking it's too, too high above their knowledge level and get scared off if they're just starting because there's so much valuable information and learning and helping each other. And I love that interaction that you can find so often in Native Plant Societies between the person who's just getting curious and interested and the person who's self-taught and has been doing this for decades and has their own level of expertise, but it's all been through informal learning. And then also with the professionals as well, and having that mix of ideas and thoughts and knowledge and that sharing of experiences and knowledge is so valuable and so important. Yeah. Each level brings something different to to the discussion that I think it all plays off of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the newbies just want the native plants in their yard, while some of the professionals, not all of them, of course, you know, see them more academically and, and are thinking of them in the wild and on field trips. But, you know, when you bring those two groups of people together and say, yeah, it was great to see that on a field trip. I'd like to grow that in my yard. Is that possible? And, you know, so then kind of the two, the two of them come together and, uh, and that's really neat. And the newbies, they don't know the questions that they're not supposed to ask or what's not supposed to happen. So when they see something, they describe what they see. And sometimes that's something that everybody else just kind of wrote off because it's quote unquote, not supposed to be like that. And then when you actually stop and look, you're like, oh, well, wait a minute, maybe we need to rethink something. So that's always a valuable 
aspect too, I think, in any of the scientific fields and research, because we all get we all get struck by the curse of knowledge and <laughs> we start to assume that things are the way we read it in the books and it's supposed to be in the plants and the animals don't read the books. <laughs> right. But one of the, my stories is several years ago, a girlfriend of mine said, you know, I've been trying to figure out what this golden rod in my garden is, and it's been here all along. And I, I just don't know what it is. And I said, well, I'll try to take a stab. Maybe I can key it out. Um, and so I started doing that. She gave me a piece of it. And uh, so I started keying it out and going down the path of identification. And after a while, it's like, you know, I think this is a rare one. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, nobody ever would have thought here she was in a neighborhood that had been developed. And here's this golden run. And it it turned out to be a rare one. Uh -huh. And it had only been reported from two other locations in Georgia and one in Tennessee. And nobody told me that it couldn't be that. You know? <laughs> so I'm just going down the path. And uh, and we got uh, a botanist came out and confirmed it and vouchered it and documented it. And it was way cool. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because I didn't really know any better. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. one other thing about you know experts versus non-experts, and that it it it's has changed over time. I believe uh, I'd say over the last five to eight years, uh, the number of people interested in native plants, native plant gardening, has just exploded and. We like to like to hope that uh, part of that interest is due to our educational efforts as plant societies, uh, and so it's so great to see so much interest in in native plant gardening these days. There certainly has been, uh, my estimation, quite a kickoff of it, particularly just the last few years. I think when the pandemic came along, I think native plant societies and native plant education was perfectly poised to help folks who were suddenly found themselves being at home uh, much for much longer periods of time than they'd ever been home before. And there was just an awful lot of folks that were saying, you know, I think I can do better. You know, they were looking at their landscape, their, their, their vast expanses of lawn with nothing really interesting going on there. Um, and looking at, and looking at their garden beds, thinking, you know, I can, I can make a difference. You know, you don't need to have a vast estate to make a difference. You know, you can take your little piece of heaven there, your little gardens, and start adding native plants there and really make, make a difference in your own backyard. And I think the native plant societies were really well poised to provide that information to people as they suddenly started rethinking about what they could do with their gardens and what their garden spaces could look like. Yes. And that kind of leads me into what I was going to ask about next. I mean, obviously... Every state's native plant society is going to do things slightly differently. Um, but what are some of the examples of specific activities or things that your native plant societies do and have to offer for people who want to get involved? Well, NPSNJ, the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, we, we have an enormous number of opportunities at this point. We've grown quite a lot over the, about the last five years. We have uh, over a thousand members, over 1,200 members across, not only in New Jersey, but beyond our state borders, because as COVID came on, uh, we pivoted uh, very quickly and created a webinar series, uh, which allowed us to reach out to people well beyond our state borders. So we have webinars, many of which are recorded and available on our website. We have in-person workshops, we have hikes, we have 11 chapters in the state, so you can join different chapters and get become involved in people in your community. We have plant sales, we have plant giveaways, we have seed swaps. Um, we have advocacy. Uh, we do some advocacy work at both the local and the state level to work toward legislation and other actions that benefit native plants within the state. Um, we, we give out mini grants for projects. Um, and we have conferences that folks can attend um, either virtually or in person. So, so we have a lot of different um, activities, both at the chapter level and at the state level where uh, you know, folks 
in the state of New Jersey and beyond can participate with the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. Hey, yeah, uh, Kentucky, we, we do much the same. Uh, traditionally, uh, field trips in, in various natural areas uh, is one of our main things. We have two conferences, not so much conferences, we just call them get togethers. Uh, in one in the spring and one in the fall, our, our wildflower weekend in April, which this will be our 35th year of doing uh, the wildflower weekend, where uh, we go to a, a state park and have, have talks. We have uh, multiple hikes and so forth. Uh, we do, for people who want a little more information, we have symposia and workshops. For, for many years, KNPS did an annual Kentucky Botanical Symposium, and it was a, you know, a very small gathering all day of, of uh, very technical discussions and all of that. Uh, but there'd generally be at most 40, 50 people. Uh, and then COVID came along, and we still wanted to do our Botanical Symposium. And so we decided, well, let's, let's try it virtually. And as, as Randy said, uh, we discovered and realized that, well, wait a minute, we don't have to limit our speakers to people who can travel to Frankfurt <laughs> for <laughs> the Botanical Symposium. They could be anywhere. So our very first one, our keynote of the symposium was Alan Weekly of the floor of the Southeast. And we just last month had our third annual virtual symposium. We decided that's, that's the way to go. And we had over 300 people registered uh, to view it online. We had speakers from uh, Missouri, Kentucky. Alan joined us again from uh, North Carolina. So uh, uh, the symposium is, is becoming a, a very important educational tool. And just one other thing that we do that I think is, is really valuable is we give out research grants to students who are studying uh, botany or ecosystem. And, uh, you know, they're not huge grants, but uh, oftentimes when you're a, uh, an undergrad or graduate working on a particular botanical project, you know, a $500 or $700 uh, grant can go a long way for you to complete the research. And so it, it, it brings, you know, opportunity to, to young people just getting started in in botany and ecosystem. So I'm, I'm proud of that uh, aspect of our, our, of our work, so. Yes, exactly. And like you said, those small scholarships for students that are working on their projects, that can be quite a bit, really. I mean, students are really good about stretching money <laughs> for research projects. They have to be. Well, in Georgia, we have uh, many of the same activities. Um, we have eight chapters now, and that's actually fairly new for us. Um, for many years, the Plant Society was run out of Atlanta uh, with not many chapters, or they were far away. So uh, in 2019, right before the pandemic, <laughs> we ripped ourselves apart and uh, elevated uh, our board up at the state level and did a big push for chapters. So now we have, we went from three to eight and uh, that's been very, it was actually very good for the pandemic because it helped bring activities more locally. Uh, people didn't have to tra travel to Atlanta. We turned our annual conference to virtual uh, like Jeff did, and we are on our third uh, virtual conference, and that allowed us to reach more people throughout the state, because Georgia is a pretty big state, and so people weren't always able to come to the annual conference, so having it online has helped us reach more people. Uh, we also have, of course, our uh, couple of signature programs. One is the Plant of the Year program, where we get our members to nominate and vote on a plant that deserves more attention. And so then we promote that through the year. We do a t-shirt design for it to help people uh, celebrate it. Uh, another signature program is our rescue program, which 
pretty much evolved about the time that the society was forming. And so that's helped bring a lot of people, new people like me, into the organization. But uh, a lot of us stay. It's not just they come for free plants and then leave. Um, Many of our rescue participants have gone on to become leaders in the society at the chapter and the state level. Uh, We also do restoration projects. Chapters will uh, have one or more restoration locations at a park um, where they remove invasives, create signage, encourage uh, people that are walking through. Because usually, as I said, it's in a park. So people are walking through. What are you doing? Oh, well, we're pulling out English ivy so that the trillium can... uh, come back and uh, thrive. And so that's one way that when we're in the public, people get to know us. We wear name badges and everything so they can recognize us. But other than that, you know, we have newsletters, we're on social media, um, just little ways to reach people a little bit at a time to help them learn more about plants and learn to appreciate them and learn to help them want them and want them in their garden. Nice. Yeah, one one thing that I forgot that, uh, again, we got much more involved with it um, with the start of COVID is uh, uh, the use of iNaturalist. I don't know how familiar people are with iNaturalist, but it's a enormously valuable citizen community science project online. And we, Started uh, the COVID year, we decided the week leading up to our wildflower weekend each year, we said, well, you know what, since there's people out there want to learn about plants who uh, may not uh, be able to make it up to the wildflower weekend, we set up a week long what we call a botany blitz. And uh, we set up a project on iNaturalist that anybody who joins the project has, has an account on iNaturalist and makes an observation during that week within uh, the boundaries of, of Kentucky, their observations will show up. And we start that week off by having 10 or 12 field trips around the state where we encourage people, get and bring your phone, bring uh, an iNaturalist, and we identify, uh, help them learn about that. And uh, last year, it was our second year. Uh, we had, I think it was 6,000 observations roughly of uh, about, uh, what was it, uh, 800 species of uh, individual species and uh, had observations of six rare species, uh, a couple of which were county records had never been seen before. And this was just uh, community citizen scientists going out on one of these uh, walks and uh, finding finding some rare plants. So uh, we're, we're starting to use iNaturalist a lot more in, in a variety of projects. That sounds like that was a brilliant project, Jeff. Well, thank you. It wasn't they, mine. They have to steal that one. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, and that's one of the things I love about Native Plant Societies too. Well, anybody in this field really is that we all share and it's like, oh, I like that idea. I, I want to adapt. How do I, come on, help me. And we're all so happy to help each other and stuff. So yeah, it's always been like that. Well, I know one of the things that in New Jersey, you know, it during COVID, you know, folks simply were not getting together very much. In our, our two uh, annual meetings, we have a fall conference and the annual meeting in the spring and, and they went uh, virtual, which was, was great. And as, as, noted you know you can you can bring in speakers from much further away and we've been doing that for our webinar Wednesday webinar series as well and in just a couple of weeks here I think actually before this podcast drops we'll be um, having our first in-person annual meeting since 2020 uh, it's very exciting and we're having a hybrid actually so we're going to have a group come in that's going to be uh, broadcasting it live as well as folks coming together in person because there is something uh, as much as Zoom has has saved us, um, there's something nice about getting together with other native plant enthusiasts and simply geeking out about native plants. Uh, one of the things that 
um, we're thinking about doing this year, uh, New Jersey actually has some, some fabulous natural areas. Uh, for example, the Pine Barrens and the Great Swamp. And we're thinking of doing a uh, NPS NJ weekend at one of these locations and making sure that everybody wears their NPS NJ bling with them so to identify them. So it's not going to be an activity where we're all getting together in one place, but we're just going to encourage folks to come and explore this great natural area. And while we're there, since everyone will be wearing something that identifies them as a member of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey, it'll be a great way to just sort of sort of catch people's eyes like, oh, you're a member too. Oh, you're a member too. And, and get folks to, to go out and visit. Maybe they've never been to the Great Swamp, which granted, um, not you know, a swamp is not necessarily everyone's, you know, it's not the, the most uh, evocative name uh, for a place to go, but the Great Swamp is a fabulous, uh, lovely place to visit uh, with an enormous amount of diversity of plants and birds and creatures of all sorts. But this is what I had in mind, uh, maybe piggybacking on Jeff's idea with the iNaturalist um, as that comes up. That sounds like that could be, uh, I'm, I'm thinking on this, I'm thinking. <laughs> One of the things I want to touch on based on what you guys said is that uh, I didn't mention earlier, you know, partnerships, the partnerships that we have with other organizations in the state where we try to expand the message through the partnerships. Uh, yes. For example, uh, Georgia Audubon. Um, Audubon has done so much with promoting birds and native plants for birds. Um, so that we we've been partnering with them on a number of activities, but there is uh, you guys mentioned field trips. There is another organization in Georgia that's actually older than we are, uh, called the Georgia Botanical Society, uh, which many of us are, are dual members. But their their signature program is our field trips. Um, and they do field trips almost every weekend, and they do a three-day wildflower pilgrimage to a part of the state, like you're talking about, Randy. And they've been doing this, this is their 54th one coming up, where they do, and they have field trips. So, so uh, my point is, we try not to necessarily step on other organizations' specialties that's not to say we don't have field trips, we do, but we try to cross promote the other one, you know, oh, you like field trips, we well, definitely need to check out this group, what, you want to learn more about birds now that you, well, definitely you need to work with this group, and we try to promote those partnerships, so that in, in the state of Georgia, we're working as a team, uh, doing things that we each do well, so I don't want that to get lost that part of what we do at the state level is to foster and expand those partnerships. I think you're quite right, Ellen, you know, the, the importance of, of working in partnership with other groups within the state and across state lines to um, share information and share good ideas, but also um, share, you know, share speakers, you know, uh, certainly you know, I, I've come back to our webinar series several times now, but, you know, it's it's working with speakers from other nearby states um, and either a little even a little further afield uh, that can speak to to issues that are pertinent to you know, our area and our eco regions and working with other like minded groups with similar missions and similar goals uh, within the state. I think that's really important for any native plant society um, uh, anywhere across the United States to really maximize the effect and reach reach the most people. You know, if we're all if we're all pulling in the same direction, you know, there, there's no reason for us to to compete. You know, as long as we're all pulling in the same direction, we'll all make better progress that way. Indeed, and uh, it just reminded me of, uh, a partnership that we're talking about right or partnerships if you will that we're talking about right now one of our, our board members brought the idea to us is we're looking at partnering with uh, wild ones chapters and master gardeners in Kentucky to provide them small grants 
and uh, knowledge to help those local people go into schools, build pollinator gardens, talk, you know, work with, with the kids in their communities. Um, and we could, we could then provide expertise to tell them, okay, well, these are the native plants you might want to look at. Uh, and here's, you know, $500 to help you get uh, the seeds and the plants and all of that. So uh, uh, yeah, the more we can, we can collaborate, uh, the more we can get done to, to preserve our, our native ecosystems. So. And I mean, we've got a variety of different native plant societies uh, represented here that do a variety of different types of things organized in a variety of different ways. I know Georgia and New Jersey both have chapters. Kentucky, we don't. Um, we've got northern part of the eastern U.S. representing the southern part, kind of central part of the eastern U.S. So I've tried hard with this group to get some diversity in here. And still, we all do a lot of similar things generally. But for people who aren't in these three states, but want to get involved and say, oh, this sounds really cool. There's probably a native plant society in your state. Most states have them. All you have to do is go to Google or your favorite internet search browser and type <laughs> in your state native plant society, and it will probably come up. And for those of you who are in New Jersey, Kentucky, or Georgia, don't worry. Everything is going to be in the show notes for the website <laughs> links for the Facebook pages. I'll make it real easy for us. So I loved your story at the beginning, Ellen, about how you you actually found a rare species just by going through the keys and trying to figure out what it was just right there in the neighborhood. And I think that story is becoming more common as more people look. I mean, they're rare plants, so no, it's not going to be in every neighborhood. But still, as we look more and have more people looking, we are finding more. But there's also other cool stories as well. Um, do any of you all have other stories about native plants or things that have happened within the native plant society that you want to share with us? Well, one, it's not really a collaboration that we've had, but one of the things that we have in, in New Jersey, we have the North Jersey uh, Butterfly Association and they do butterfly counts and they're always looking for rare butterflies. And I'll tell you the story because it's sort of embarrassing. My husband and I are both actually trained as entomologists um, and, um, this was several years ago in a park nearby here called Horseshoe Bend. They discovered that there was a butterfly called the gray comma, not the eastern comma, but the gray comma butterfly. And they were all very excited because it only feeds on ribes. Ribes missouriense in particular is its, its main host plant, which is in our neck of the woods is a reasonably rare plant. And, um, well, my husband and I never actually looked that closely at the comma butterflies on the property. We're like, well, I, I don't know. I, I just always assumed they were Eastern commas. No, no, they were great. Well, we have both actually. We had the Eastern gray commas. And then we went over to the patch of gooseberries in the edge of our woods that we just always assumed they were up fairly close to some houses. And we figured that they were left over from some previous property owner and figured that they were garden variety gooseberries. Well, no, actually they were ribes, Missouri ants, and there were the caterpillars of the gray, wow. sorry, the, the, the gray comma butterflies on the Missouri gooseberries on the edge of the property. Like, well, you know, if you, you just, you need to simply, we all need to simply open up our eyes and, and look and see what we can see. Um, when uh, I have conversations with folks, sometimes going back to one of my earlier comments about uh, political boundaries, um, you know, I've, I've talked to folks that will say, well, you know, I, I keyed it out and it looked like it was this species, but the maps say that it's <laughs> not in my county. They say it's in the county north, south, east, and west of my county, but not in my county. Well, the maps, when we look at maps, whether it's the USGA plant maps or the Biota North America project maps, or even iNaturalist maps, they're showing where someone has reported that species from. Um, it doesn't mean it's not necessarily there. So it's always worth, it's always worth taking a second look and seeing 
who that plant is or who that creature is that's using that plant um, in an area because you just never know quite what you're going to find. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, great story. My native plant stories, if you will, need a little bit of background. Uh, when Liz and I and our son moved uh, here to, to Kentucky, uh, she's originally from this area, uh, McCracken County, Kentucky. Uh, met her and married her and started a family out in California. Uh, and uh, when we moved back here in 1987, we moved on to uh, 10 acres that we had bought uh, that was basically farmland. Corn, beans, hay was what was grown there. And we decided that we wanted to restore it to native Kentucky woodland. And the approach we took was, uh, Liz always says, it's a combination of, uh, of the Hippocratic Oath and the prime directive from Star Wars in that first, do no harm, and secondly, don't interfere unless it's absolutely necessary. And so our, <laughs> our, the way we worked is we said, okay, we'll let everything grow, pop up, uh, spread native seed now and then, but uh, primarily let let everything grow. And if it's non-native, when it gets big enough to identify, if it's non-native, we kill it and get rid of it. And so over the past 37 years, we now have a, a young native woodland on the 10 acres where it was all farm. And, you know, it's still got lots of invasives and, you know, it's it, the tree mix is not what would have been here in a, in a you know, primordial forest. Uh, but almost every year, a new native species pops up on our, our land, I mean, almost every year. And the ones that, that have been most exciting to me is that we now have four species of native terrestrial orchids, all of which volunteered uh, on, on our little 10 acre patch that is still surrounded by <laughs> agriculture and so forth. And to see, you know, native orchids just coming up on their own was just, is just so exciting and, and so gratifying that things are working and combine that with the amount of wildlife we now see on this little 10 acres, uh, you know, all the common ones, but gray fox and uh, uh, owls we hear almost every night and hawks, uh, Cooper's hawks coming flying past the front windows. Um, it, it's just, you know, shows what a native plant ecosystem can do even on a small scale. And if we could just re reforest <laughs> uh, millions of acres, just think how much better things would be in this world, so. Well, I can't say I have any more good stories. Um, <laughs> it, it certainly has been a wonderful journey. And, and that's how I try to explain it to people, especially self-taught people. I mean, I'm self-taught. Remember, I'm the one who said they were going for free plants. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I tell people you just learn a little bit at a time and, and every step takes you down a pathway of knowing more and, you know, every plant that you sit down and learn more about either through a key or talking it through with somebody else and saying, you know, I'm trying to figure out what this plant is that popped up in my yard and, you know, okay, well, what's the leaf arrangement? You know, is it woody? Is it not? Um, does it have flowers? What do they look like? You know, every little step on that journey takes you further down, helps you appreciate more and opens up another layer. Um, as Randy said, you know, butterflies, you know, people start seeing uh, butterflies in their yard that they didn't see before. Once you open your eyes, it's, it's amazing. And you just, you see things you haven't seen. Maybe they were there all along. Maybe they weren't. It's hard to say, but... I've really enjoyed the journey and uh, and I would do it all over again. I, it's it's a great one. So 
I guess that's my story. And I love that. That is so true too, is to remember that it is a journey and that we all start somewhere and it's a fun journey and it leads you down so many different rabbit holes as you go <laughs> through and different paths to explore. But are there any questions that you guys get asked often that we haven't covered or talked about yet related to native plants or native plant societies that you think we should talk about? Well, I think advocacy is one that we get a lot. And Randy touched on that they're doing some advocacy and, and we're starting to dip our toe into it as well. And that, that was one of the things that we felt was a benefit to pulling ourselves up as a, as a state board uh, so that we could put our time into doing things that benefit at the state level and let our chapters take care of the members. So advocacy is a question that we get a lot. You know, how can we get Bradford pears outlawed? And why do we still have English ivy being sold in the stores? And and why are they doing mosquito spray? And can't we get them to stop that? And why do you have a non-native plant as your state flower? <laughs> <laughs> what is the state flower, Ellen? It is a non-native rose. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an Asian rose um, called the Cherokee rose. And uh, somehow... <laughs> At the time that it was nominated over a hundred years ago, the person that nominated it thought that it was native. Um, so, I mean, but it, that little things like that, I mean, there are more important things than changing the state flower. I'd much rather outlaw bread for <laughs> But um, So advocacy, I think, is, is what uh, some people are turning to us and saying, can't you do something about this? And so we're trying to get our arms around that. We're trying to Im involve the green industry uh, because we realize that they make money off of Bradford pears and English ivy. So, you know, how can we work together um, to remove some of the worst of these um, and maybe help getting you grow more native plants? Uh, as a replacement so that uh, you don't lose money. But I, I would say that these days, that's a question we get a lot. Help with homeowners associations. Um, you know, how can we get the city to plant more plants, uh, more native plants in our parks, uh, things like that. And then so we're, we're starting to dip our toe into that and, uh, and see if we can flex a little state muscle. We get a lot of questions about, you know, what what should I plant? What can I plant? What is deer resistant? And our website has information. We have lists on all those things. Uh, what are good native trees? What are trees that are native to my county? What are good understory trees? Um, rain gardens, actually, our, uh, our website has a really nice, uh, if I do say so myself, uh, rain garden manual uh, that we put together several years ago uh, in collaboration with Rutgers University. And that's available on our website, which gives very detailed instructions on how to put in rain gardens um, to help to manage, not only manage water flow, but also help to clean the water as it, it goes back into the ground. Uh, one of the groups that we've actually partnered with is something called Jersey Friendly Yards. And they have a lovely website that allows you to basically you know, sort of design a garden on their website using uh, primarily natives, I believe on Jersey friendly yards, but how, how to incorporate native plants, I think into their gardens, because there are so many choices. And um, one of the wonderful things about native plants is really there is a plant for every place. You know, there are plants that grow in sandy soils. There are plants that grow on top of rocky mountain tops. There are plants that grow in wet swales and ditches. There are plants that grow in dry areas. So there's really a much greater variety of native plants available for landscape choices than you would tend to think of if you're looking at sort of the average plants that are available in most large garden centers. Um, but helping to guide folks uh, into what plants they might want to consider to put into their landscapes. I think that's a question that we get a lot of, and we try to address it quite a bit, both through the lists that are available on our website, 
as well as uh, some of, certainly some of our, our Wednesday webinars um, address specifically how to landscape with native plants. Nice. And sort of a corollary to, to you know, what plant should I plant and how should I landscape it? A, a common question we get or I get from gardeners, they've got these new native plants in their garden and all that. And they come and they say, something's chewing up all my native plants. <laughs> and what what should I use to kill them all, you know, kill whatever's chewing it up. And that, you know, really is a great entryway into explaining, well, no, the reason, one of the main reasons for growing native plants is to provide food for the, the native ecosystem, including the bugs. And uh, uh, the more your native plants in your garden are being chewed up, the better better you're doing in terms of building a native ecosystem. So as they say, if something's not eating your plants, you're doing something wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Well, this has been really, really interesting. Do you guys have anything else you want to share before we wrap up? I think you said you were going to have information on how to contact our, our different societies uh, on the uh, program notes. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly we'll have information on how to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all those good things, as well as information on, on how to become a member of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey. And the other thing, thing I'd say to your listeners is uh, when you finish listening to the podcast, get outside and look at plants. Doesn't even matter. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if indeed. You know what they are, just get out and look at them. Yeah, I like to, when I give a presentation about using native plants and what it can do for you in your yard, kind of turn it back into a little more of a nature place. You know, uh, a popular saying that gets uh, said is uh, nature doesn't live somewhere else. You know, nature can live where you are and you can just step outside, right, Jeff? And find yes. it right there. I mean, I just love uh, when I was working and I was working from home, just in between meetings, just step outside and see who's out there. Is it a butterfly? Is it a bee? Is it a bird? I wanted to see something using my yard. Absolutely. So get out there and look around. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And that's really why I started this whole podcast and the blog and the YouTube channel as well as because we wanted to help people be able to do that and encourage them to get out and start looking and exploring and learning more about the nature that's all around us. Because so often, I think a lot of us, I'm, I know I did, and I don't think I'm alone. I know I'm not alone. I've talked to enough people to know I'm not alone in this. Um, we grew up loving nature and being outside. And it was the things that we saw outdoors and around our homes as kids that got us interested a lot of times. But then we thought that everything cool and interesting was someplace far, far away in an ex some kind of semi-pristine or pristine wilderness area. And that's not the case. There's really cool stuff right around us in our yards, in our communities, and we can do more to enhance that and get excited. So yeah, that's one of the things that I'm really interested in too is promoting and encouraging that mindset and native plant societies do such a great job of helping people realize even what's what what a native plant is to your region I mean we've talked about it already but so often that's that's the basis you've got to know what's native before you can even start planting native plants mm -hmm. but so yeah this has been really really interesting and educational and like we've already said, I will have references in the show notes and links for everybody that's in New Jersey and Georgia and Kentucky to be able to quickly find Native Plant Society information there. But thank you guys again so much for talking with us today. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah, thanks for letting us have a voice. Thanks so much, Shannon. I enjoyed this conversation. And uh, thanks. I, I agree with Ellen. Thanks for letting us have a voice here. Oh, you're very welcome. Have a great day. I appreciate Jeff, Randy, and Ellen taking the time to talk with us. I really do believe in the value of Native Plant Societies and encourage you to check out your state's Native Plant Society. Even if you're just getting started, don't let that scare you off. We all started at the beginning, and most Native Plant Society members that I've met love to share their passion and help others learn. 
And remember, plants don't pay attention to geopolitical boundaries. So if it makes more sense for you to participate in the activities of a neighboring state's Native Plant Society, then that's okay too. As a side note, we have lots of exciting opportunities planned with Backyard Ecology over the next several months. If you want to keep up with everything going on in the Backyard Ecology world, then please subscribe to our emails. You can do so at www.backyardecology.net slash subscribe. And when you sign up for our emails, you'll also be able to download a free ebook that explains why our familiar garden zones really don't mean anything when it comes to gardening with native plants. That's just our way of saying thank you for your interest in backyard ecology. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.